this honking isn't doing anybody any good. Yeah, and it's definitely not moving the traffic. We should all just shut up. Maybe even get some sleep. Now you're talking. Oh, mama. I felt like I was in the Twilight Zone or something. I figured I'd better check this out. Oh, another prisoner. Hi, mate. Hey, it's Barney. Oh, for a minute, I thought you were locked in a cell. But you're out. I'm the one that's in, right? What are you in for, pal? <laughs> Otis. Wait a minute. You're Andy. Huh? You ain't in and you ain't out. Me? I ain't in and I ain't out. I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> Mankind is prone to fear. We fall victim to our own imagination allowing thoughts to run wild and create ideas. Ideas that can be pleasant dreams or sickening nightmares. Creating worlds that can be similar to our own, but unsettlingly different in only the slightest of ways. However, fear comes in many forms, disguising itself as anxiety, uneasiness. The fears of mankind grow restless as they consume the minds of those who seek to chase their fears. One such man, the subject of our tale, sought to bring our fears, our morbid curiosities to life, allowing humanity to come face to face with our monsters within the Twilight Zone. Our account was first set in motion in the year 1958. The television broadcasting network CBS had just finalized a deal with screenwriter and presenter Rod Serling for the possession of his teleplay, The Time Element. Yet, in order to fully understand the importance of this single man's involvement moving forward, we first have to look farther back. Up until this point in time, Serling was best known for his work in the realm of realistic and historical fiction. Mr. Serling developed an interest in writing at a young age first finding his voice around the 7th grade after joining his school's debate team alongside writing for the school newspaper. This interest continued to develop throughout his teenage years, but was interrupted after his high school graduation by the growing threat that was the Second World War. Rather than going to college as Serling had planned on doing after graduation, the young man decided to enlist in 1943. During his time in the army, Serling remained a private of seemingly little importance yet was always doing something to catch the eye of the higher-ups, resulting in Private Serling receiving a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star Medal before his eventual discharging in 1946. Returning to the States, he quickly attempted to resume life where he had left off, attending Antioch College in Ohio and using his benefits under the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, better known as the GI Bill. While waiting for classes to resume, during the summer, Serling worked as a volunteer at the WNYC radio station in New York, where he provided his services as both an actor and a writer. Within the next few years, Serling began working at the on-campus radio station at Antioch, before eventually taking charge as the head of all radio productions at the college. At the same time, Serling's reputation as a writer began to grow after winning a script writing contest run by the radio program Dr. Christian, along with several other writers such as Earl Hammer Jr. Serling's career in radio continued on until 1950, where he followed several other known radio authors in the transition to writing for television, a medium that was gaining more popularity. At the WKRC TV station in Cincinnati, Ohio, Serling began writing for a wide array of programs run by the station, most notably his work on the anthology series The Storm, along with several other anthology shows. In 1952, Serling quit his job at the television station and went on to become a freelance writer, followed by a move to Connecticut in the early months of the next year. Serling continued on in his pursuit of screenwriting, submitting work to other well-known anthology shows before once again moving locations with his family, living in New York by the end of 1954 under the recommendation of his agent. It wouldn't be until another year later when Serling would see a sudden growth in regards to his career again. January 12th of 1955 saw the initial airing of Patterns, one of Serling's many contributions to the Kraft Television Theater. The script was seen by Serling as simply another submission to the program, thinking nothing of the contents. 
yet not long after the initial airing, reviews began to roll in. Reviewers such as Jack Gould of the New York Times declared that, quote, The enthusiasm is justified. In writing, action, and direction, patterns will stand as one of the high points in the TV medium's evolution, end quote. Following the success of Patterns, Serling began selling several of his older scripts as he continued working on his future writings, receiving job offers from all around the country requesting new work of his. Publicity for Serling began to die out, though, due to the poor quality of his older scripts that were being sold and televised. Despite criticism, Serling went on to write Requiem for a Heavyweight, which later aired in October of 1956 for Playhouse 90 on CBS. Once again, the growing playwright had struck gold, earning much praise. Quote, Requiem for a Heavyweight by Rod Serling, presented last night on Playhouse 90, was a play of overwhelming force and tenderness, New York Times critic Jack Gould wrote in his second article praising Serling's work. It was an artistic triumph that featured a performance of indescribable poignancy by Jack Palance. Mr. Serling wrote a searing, inspired indictment of the worst side of the prize fight game, the greedy mortals who live off the flesh and blood of helpless youths who want to be champions. His play depicted the utter brutality and inhumanity of the so-called sport. The climax may have been a little more obscure. Either way, Mr. Serling's play had immense power in poetry and is certain to win many a prize. Mr. Serling and Mr. Palance contributed a notable evening of theater last night on Channel 2. End quote. With his confidence and morale boosted, Serling decided to make one more move with his family to California, the new heart of the growing television empire. Prior to his move to California, Serling had also submitted a script titled Noon on Doomsday to another one of CBS's anthology series, The United States Steel Hour. However, this time Serling knew that this submission may have been a risk. Noon on Doomsday was what he considered to be his first foray into more philosophical and controversial writing. Noon on Doomsday was Serling's retelling of the Till case in a format that he knew would be more acceptable for a television broadcast. The Till case was a name given to a 1955 court case in Mississippi, where Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African-American boy, was kidnapped and lynched by two white men after being accused of antagonizing a white woman within her grocery store. The two men were taken trial, where they were deemed not guilty by an all-white jury, in spite of the history of violence that the two men had. To mirror the Till case, Serling wrote the tale of an old Jewish man who owned a pawn shop, being targeted and eventually killed by an unstable man who was always on the lookout for anyone to victimize and use as a scapegoat. After airing, the public soon became wise to the underlying commentary, resulting in the theater guild behind the United States Steel Hour receiving an estimated 16,000 letters from white supremacist groups criticizing Noon on Doomsday for its social commentary. While it is now recognized that Serling did intend for the script to mirror the Till case, at the time, he never directly confirmed or denied the connection between the two, best known as simply stating, if the shoe fits, in response to questions over the issue. As the uproar over the play began to die down, Serling decided that it was time to make another bold move in regards to his writing. Whereas Noon on Doomsday was his first script he considered to be thought-provoking and controversial, his next work, The Time Element, became Serling's first step into the world of writing science fiction. The time element told the story of a man with repeating dreams, dreams that depicted him attempting to warn others about the 1941 Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The time element set up the recurring writing formula that Serling would continue to use in his career, with the script containing an introductory narration as well as a closing narration, which followed a twist ending on a story that was often classified as science fiction or fantasy. As writing on his new teleplay finished in 1958, Serling took it to CBS with the hopes of it being likable enough to produce as a pilot for a new television series, where CBS hastily purchased the script. Unfortunately, while the deal between the studio and Serling went forward, production on anything related to the time element fell through, leaving Serling with no opportunity of seeing his pilot become a reality. The script for the time element was forgot about and disappeared into the CBS archives among the other discarded scripts the network had acquired over the years. With his newest project being postponed indefinitely, Serling continued writing as a freelancer in order to put forth new work. 
Although Sterling had moved past the idea of creating a series on CBS, the opportunity was once again going to present itself to the unsuspecting writer. Later in that same year, newly assigned producer Burt Granite began rifling through the CBS archives, hoping to find a script to add a bit of credibility to the Westinghouse Deathloop Playhouse, another anthology series that was currently running on the network. Searching through the vault with the hopes of possibly finding an undiscovered screenplay by Serling, Granite eventually stumbled upon the abandoned Time Element script. Production quickly began on turning the Time Element into an episode, before finally making it to air on November 24th, 1954. Just as with his previous works, thousands of letters began flooding the Playhouse's office. Yet this time, rather than defensive criticism, the contents of the letter contained praise and adoration for Serling's newest piece. With Serling finding his way back into the spotlight, CBS took note of his rise in fame, resuming talks of a new series with the playwright, now convinced that a series based on Serling's writings could possibly work. In collaboration with the network, our intrepid author hastily began working on a new script to be used as a pilot for a developing series resulting in the creation of the new story, Where Is Everybody?, that served as the announcement episode for Serling's new original series, The Twilight Zone. <laughs>